Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, our service today. It's a great joy and a privilege to share it with you. Uh, wherever you may be uh, physically, we are united together in spirit as we share this time together. If you'd like to follow along uh, the order of service, uh, you can find it uh, in the sermon section of our website. The season of Pentecost is all about growth, and our service today looks at how, with small beginnings, uh, the power and work of the Holy Spirit brings about uh, transformation in our lives uh, and in our world. Most appropriate uh, for this theme of uh, growth, uh, we're celebrating uh, the high school or post-secondary graduations of six members of our parish family, all of whom we've been blessed to see grow little by little from children to the excellent young adults that they are today. Uh, we're also remembering how this growth continues every day of our lives. Uh, in an interview with Betty Naderak, who's embarking on the new adventure of being ordained to the diaconate on June 29th and then serving as a deacon at St. Paul's. I invite us to begin in prayer together. Let's pray. Our God of love, we thank you so much that we can share this time of worship together wherever we may be physically across the globe. We thank you that you desire this to be a, a most precious time of fellowship with you and with one another. And we pray, dear Lord, that our hearts might be united and that we might grow in your love through this worship time. May your loving purposes be accomplished in each of our lives and may you strengthen us in your loving service. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn is Come to the Well. The words are on our screen. Come to the well. Come to the water. Come to the Oh, 
Our service continues with the greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And we unite in prayer together as we say the Collect of the Day. Almighty God, without you we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We have a song we're going to sing uh, with the for our children, and uh, this is a song that's very much the theme uh, of t for today's service. It's called "Little by Little," and um, you'll see a slide there. Uh, somebody's hand and they've got a couple of little tiny things in there um, and then a, a comb. Well, that's actually, uh, those are seeds from a tree called a sequoia. And uh, so the first uh, slide will show uh, the sequoia seeds. When you, um, and so when we get to the second slide, keep an eye open for what that's going to look like because uh, it'll be a surprise of how big uh, those uh, trees get from just the tiny seeds. And we're going to sing the song through twice. And when we go a second time through, uh, we're not going to have uh, seeds there. Instead, uh, we're going to have uh, pictures of two members uh, of our parish family uh, whose uh, graduation we're celebrating today. And it's a reminder, again, these pictures, that, uh, that these uh, ones uh, started out small as children, and uh, now they're uh, young adults in what uh, seems uh, to the parents, and um, myself included, uh, just a very short period of time. Uh, and uh, it'll be the same, of course, for you. Uh, you, um, too, are growing day by day, little by little. And, uh, but it's also the, the uh, same for each of us. Uh, we grow every day of our lives. Now we don't continue to get uh, uh, bigger. Uh, some of us get bigger in some other ways that we don't particularly want to get bigger. But... Uh, but as far as uh, getting taller and stuff like that, no, that's, that does stop. Uh, but we keep growing uh, inside. We keep growing in, in love, uh, in all the, the fruit of the Spirit, that uh, love, joy, peace, and all those things. And so we remember that today, that every day of our lives, we are growing little by little. So we'll sing this song. There's a... Um, there's an action that you can do at home. I'm not going to do it here, but it's when you get to the, uh, since I made that turnabout face, you can turn uh, to face the other direction. 
uh, and then you say, uh, now I'm walking in his grace, and then you kind of uh, turn back again. Uh, don't keep turning around in a circle or you'll get yourself dizzy, so go around halfway and then go, <laughs> go back the same way, and it's, it's a little easier as far as dizziness goes. Uh, but that's one action that we've done sometimes over the years. Um, but other than that, there really aren't any actions uh, for this, uh, but we will sing it through twice so that we get familiar with the words. Little by little, every day Little by little, in every way My Jesus is changing me He's changing me Since I made that turnabout face Now I'm walking in His grace My Jesus is changing me He's changing me My precious Jesus I'm not the same person that I used to be, and if it's slow going, then there's a knowing that each day growing I will be. So that's how it goes, and uh, now we're into it a second time, and uh, there's, there's one of our folks who's graduating, and uh, I wonder if you'll be able to... to to guess uh, who that person is uh, when you see the, what they look like now. I can promise you it's quite different. <laughs> little by little, every day, little by little, in every way, my Jesus is changing me. He's changing me since I made that turnabout face. Now I'm walking in His grace, my Jesus is changing me. Changing me, my precious Jesus. I'm not the same person that I used to be. And if it's slow going, then there's a knowing that each day growing I will be. So let's just bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much that we are growing every day of our lives, and sometimes it seems hard to, to see that, Lord. Sometimes it's hard even to believe it, but you promise that it is so. We thank you that by the power of your Holy Spirit within us, day by day we are growing a little bit more, becoming more more like Jesus in the way that we love others. We ask, dear Lord, that that would continue. We pray that we might have your love in our hearts growing more and more. For we pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. We're saying together today a portion of Psalm 92, and the uh, words are on our screens, and I invite you to say the parts after the asterisk, the parts that are in the yellow uh, italics. It is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to tell of your loving kindness early in the morning and of your faithfulness in the night season, on the psaltery and on the lyre, and to the melody of the harp. For you have made me glad by your acts, O Lord, and I shout for joy because of the works of your hand. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree and shall spread abroad like a cedar of Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be green and succulent that they may show how upright the Lord is 
my rock in whom there is no fault. And let's say the prayer together. O Most High, at all times and in all seasons you are worthy of our grateful praise. Grant us the insight to perceive the greatness of your works, the certainty of being founded on you, our eternal rock, and the wisdom to sing the praises of your name in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And our first reading, uh, Stacy uh, sent me uh, the re recording of it, and unfortunately something went wrong with, with it. Uh, so uh, we're going to show a, a quick picture of Stacy just to show you <laughs> the video that we tried to get uh, for today, and then I'm going to read uh, our first reading this morning. And uh, our first reading is from the first book of Samuel, the 15th chapter, beginning at the 34th verse. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and made him pass before Saul. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn is Unto thee, O Lord, and I should mention that three of our four hymns today are ones that we actually haven't sung yet uh, uh, from March 2020 to the present. 
unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord, unto thee, O Lord, you will lift up my soul, you will lift up my soul, unto thee, O Lord, unto thee, O Lord, you will lift up my soul, you will lift up my soul, oh my God. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be now and ever acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In the New Living Translation, God says in Zechariah uh, chapter 4, It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Now that was speaking about the reconstruction of the temple, but Today we are looking at that as really a principle that holds true uh, in all the things that we might be doing. 
Uh, today we're looking at little things and not despising small beginnings. Start with today's gospel. The context is set forth well by Bob Hearsping. He writes, Jesus brings the remarkable news of the coming of the reign of the living God. The grand day of salvation for which Israel awaits is here. In his ministry, in his very person, the rule of God has broken into the world. The kingdom of God has come to earth. No wonder the crowds who followed Jesus are flying high. This is the good news for which God's people had been waiting for centuries. But as weeks turn into months, a lot of people begin to mutter. Disillusionment begins to settle in like a dark cloud on a January day. The facts suggest that Jesus has overpromised and will underdeliver. The message seems hyped. Sure, some people have been helped. Over there, uh, John is back on his feet, and uh, uh, someone knows of Mary who's been cured of her blindness, but, but surely this cannot be God's whole game plan. The religious intelligentsia wants nothing to do with Jesus. The Roman authorities in Jerusalem act as though he doesn't exist. Jesus says God's kingdom has come, but where? A bunch of fishers have become his followers. Some sick folk healed of disease. But certainly these meager results aren't something to stake your life upon. What gives? Isn't this a case of false advertising? I think that this context of confusion uh, is uh, what Jesus met as he spoke the words uh, in our gospel. And that, that's, um, that context of confusion, I think, is very much still present today. Here Spink continues, we gather to worship Sunday after Sunday to hear the kingdom announced. We rejoice that Christ is the king of the cosmos. But when we go out into the week, doesn't it seem that your confession is far removed from fact? Helmut Tillich, the German pastor, related what it was like engaging in pastoral ministry during the terrible days of the Third Reich. About the time the Nazis came to power, Tillich was ordained a pastor in the Lutheran Church. He held his very first Bible study in his parish, determined to trust the claim of Jesus, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth, determined to confess that Christ, not a Nazi madman, but Christ is Lord. And at that Bible study, there were three persons, three, two elderly women and an elderly man. And Tillichy said he was shaken. Three people were all the kingdom of the cosmos had called out that night. And while they met, he could hear outside the young men in their Nazi uniforms marching row after row. Where was the power of the Christ who claims that the kingdoms of this world are under his control? Unmarked. Graves are discovered for 215 precious First Nations children whose existence is not even acknowledged. A loving family of five is murdered while crossing the road simply because they're Muslims. No, still today, evil seems so strong and the good can seem so weak. Well, here Spink concludes, we hear Jesus say the kingdom of God is upon us. The blessings of God's rule are here, and still we struggle with death and disease. Our marriage crumbles, our hopes for a bright future fade, and we face a harsh challenge to our faith. Does Jesus really have his facts straight? Are his claims true? Well, in this context of confusion, uh, Jesus uses two parables to help his listeners understand. 
In the first one he says, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He doesn't know how. But the earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. And uh, seeds, so small. If you didn't know anything about nature, uh, who would expect ever anything to come from something that tiny? But the seed contains in itself the power to grow. The seed would sprout and grow. He does not how, Jesus says. Independent of human input and activity. No irrigation in that society. All the farmers could do was watch it grow. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. Jesus stretches that out to make his point. It may start small, but with good seed and conditions that God supplies, the harvest will come. And the farmer has a key part to play in it. It says when the earth produces that and the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. The farmer who sowed seemingly insignificant seeds now gets to play an active role again. At once, Jesus says, that the farmer does this. No delay. That There's you know, a sense of excitement here. They've waited for this. I think of harvest time on my brother-in-law's farm where everything basically stops. Everything gets pushed into the big thrust to get in the crops. There's that dedication Jesus is speaking of which all the farmers would have known about in that society too, to gathering the harvest safely in. In John chapter 4, when the disciples returned to Jesus after his encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well, he says, Do not say four months more, then comes the harvest. But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. And it says, in fact, a few verses later, that many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. Lives were transformed for all eternity. The kingdom of God is like a great harvest that comes from small but good seeds. And uh, in the second parable, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And the pictures up there are from the mustard plant in Israel. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground, ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. And Jesus is saying that is proverbial. He's not trying to make some kind of scientific uh, declaration here, but just talking about how small thing that, that seed is. And yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Jesus elsewhere talks about having faith as as small as a mustard seed. Probably this was speaking of black mustard, which was grown for oil as well as being used as a condiment. And the seed was indeed very small, proverbial for the smallest possible thing. And, uh, but although it was such a small seed, it could grow up to a height of 10 meters in one year. Remarkable for one year's growth. But more is going on here, however, than just that. Thomas Keating in his book, The Kingdom of God is Like, points out that these words would have sounded like a strange comparison to Jesus' listeners. Mustard grew so aggressively that it was often considered a weed. Indeed, it was illegal to plant mustard seed in a neighbor's garden for that very reason. The point here is that it starts small, but you can't control or domesticate God or what God might choose to do in and through us. John Dominic Crossan writes, the point, in other words, 
is not just that the mustard plant starts as a proverbially small seed and grows into a shrub of three or four feet or even higher. It's that it tends to take over wherever it's not wanted, that it tends to get out of control, and that it tends to attract birds within cultivated areas where they're not particularly desired. And that, said Jesus, was what the kingdom was like. The reference to birds of the air is an allusion to two passages in the Old Testament, one from Ezekiel and one from Daniel. Birds of the air and its branches represented all the nations, all people coming to rest in the shelter and shade of the nation of Israel. But here, it's not a noble cedar tree, but a mustard plant. Must have sounded like a joke. Jesus is saying, you're looking for big things, removing the Romans, etc. You're looking for a great cedar, but the kingdom of God has come to you like a mustard plant. But the result is the same. It spreads to all people. Birds, in fact, were very fond of the little black seeds of the mustard plant, and a cloud of birds over a mustard plant would have been a common sight to Jesus' listeners. The kingdom of God starts small but spreads, breaking out beyond all boundaries, we may attempt to give it, outstripping all human attempts to control it, to bless the whole world. John Chandler, in his blog, somestrangeideas.com, writes, I wonder what it would truly look like to plant a church that would reflect the image of the seed in the parables Jesus describes here. A church that would live by what he coins the mustard manifesto. Well, we get uh, perhaps the answer from uh, the other passages that the lectionary assigns for today. In the passage from 1 Samuel that I read, uh, it says, The Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which we didn't read today, if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything new, everything has become new. What would it look like? Well, it would be a church where we, we would not look at one another from a human point of view, limiting one another, but rather where we would see people as God sees them, as beloved with possibilities beyond human imagination, where we affirm and, uh, that transformation begins in the heart, seen only by God, but that from this small beginning, new creation comes, where we walk together in new life as the living God continues to work in us. The church whose members choose to honor and value people in the little things. A phone call to say, how are you doing? Something that has been recognized as so important in this time we've just gone through and which will continue to be so important. A word of greeting or invitation to a neighbor. A loving touch of a loved one. A church where no one is too small to be important where no one is small enough to fall through the cracks. A church where we extend the radical hospitality God has extended to us, excluding no one from our embrace, ignoring no one as insignificant, tossing no one aside as expendable, where we are intentional about tearing down the walls that prevent inclusion and empower exclusion. We set up our caring contact ministry to try to help St. Paul's be such a church. And I'm delighted to announce that Deacon Betty will be overseeing this ministry once she begins serving at St. Paul's in her diaconal ministry. This month, the month of June, the diocese has, has assigned as the month of mission. And this past week, we looked at the second mark of mission, which is to teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. I'm delighted to say that we have four uh, who are seeking baptism right now uh, in, at St. Paul's. 
uh, three for their children and one for themselves as an adult. And our grad celebration today reminds us that, uh, that we grow. We start small, but we continue to grow day by day. And Betty's ordination to the diaconate, as I said at the beginning of our service, it's a reminder that all of us keep on growing, that discipleship is a lifelong calling. As the Reverend Howard Thornton reminded us all in his uh, Spark devotional this past week, none of us have arrived like McLeod Trail in this uh, part of the city and indeed even further south, uh, we are under construction. And it can feel overwhelming, the challenges that we have before us. Uh, we're studying a book right now in Parish Council called The Post-Quarantine Church. And uh, that book makes the point that the pandemic has only accelerated the changes that were already starting to take place. And when we see those changes and we try to respond, we can feel totally inadequate. We can feel like these challenges are too great. And the little things that we can do are too little. And so we need to be reminded of those words in Zechariah from the beginning of our, this sermon. Do not despise small beginnings, for those small things transform our parish and our lives and our community and our world. When Mother Teresa, now Saint Teresa, wanted to begin her orphanage in Calcutta, she told her superiors, I have three pennies and a dream from God to build an orphanage. Her superiors chided her gently, you cannot build an orphanage with three pennies. With three pennies, you can't do anything. I know, Mother Teresa said, smiling, but with God and three pennies, I can do anything. Mother Teresa knew the truth of the words. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. She lived out the mustard manifesto and made a difference in the world with a glorious harvest that continues to spread to this day. May we at St. Paul's do the same. Now let's affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on our screens. Let us confess our faith as we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and of earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
now uh, John will lead us in the prayers of the people. The prayers of the people, with me too. Let us pray with confidence and trust, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, guard and direct your church in the way of unity, service, and praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Give to all nations an awareness of the unity of the human family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Cleanse our hearts of prejudice and selfishness, and inspire us to hunger and thirst for what is right. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Teach us to use our creation for our greater praise, that all may share the good things you provide. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen all who give their energy or skill for the healing of those who are sick in body or in mind, especially those who we now silently or alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Set free all who are, who, who are bound by fear and despair. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant a peaceful end and eternal rest for all those who are dying, and your comfort for those who mourn. I invite us, silently or loud, to remember a lot of loved ones and friends who are going to be part of this earthly life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayer in response to COVID-19. Let us share together the following prayer in response to COVID-19. Almighty God, who Son Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ suffer for us, 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 that we may have eternal life, be present with us in our suffering as, as we endure, endure the pandemic. Be present to the sick, be present to the dying, be present to the bereaved. We know no that in our love all things shall be made whole. Strengthen in us that hope which comes only from faith, faith in your unfailing love. love. Empower us, us to the instruments of healing, of healing in the decisions we make, we make and the deeds we do, do for our own nation and all, all the nations of the world. This we ask through your Son, the Savior, Jesus, Jesus Christ, who reigns with you, with you and, and the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit ever one God. God. Amen. Amen. Prayer of Christian life. Let us unite in offering this prayer of Christian life. Lord, make us instruments of peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, heart. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is dying, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. dedicate and rededicate ourselves to God and God's ways of love as we take this time now to confess our sins together. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, 
to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God has spoken peace into our hearts and so we have that most precious gift of peace to share with one another. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Wherever we may be, let's speak one another with the peace of Christ. Now at this time we pause to offer to the Lord our time, talents, and treasure, remembering that the gifts that we've been given are gifts to be shared. And uh, in our parish family, one way that we share our treasure is through the offerings that we give to St. Paul's. Thank you, everybody, for continuing to give financially to St. Paul's to help us carry out the mission of planting and nurturing the growing seeds of the Spirit in this world God loves so much. We'll listen now to our virtual choir sing the anthem, As Long as the Heart, while our screen shows a slide that mentions ways we can participate in this mission by sharing our support. Prayer over the gifts is on our screens. God of reconciliation and forgiveness, the saving work of Christ has made our peace with you. May that work grow toward its perfection in all we offer you this day. We ask this in his name. Amen. Our Eucharistic prayer is Eucharistic prayer five from the book of alternative services. And the words are on our screens. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, almighty God, for the gift of a world full of wonder and for our life which comes from you. By your power, you sustain the universe. Glory to you forever and ever. You created us to love you with all our heart and to love each other as ourselves, but we rebel against you by the evil that we do. In Jesus, your Son, you bring healing to our world and gather us into one great family. Therefore, with all who serve you on earth and in heaven, we praise your wonderful name as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
We give you thanks and praise, loving Father, because in sending Jesus, your Son, to us, you showed us how much you love us. He cares for the poor and the hungry. He suffers with the sick and the rejected. Betrayed and forsaken, he did not strike back, but overcame hatred with love. On the cross, he defeated the power of sin and death. By raising him from the dead, you show us the power of your love to bring new life to all your people. Glory to you forever and ever. On the night before he gave up his life for us, Jesus, at supper with his friends, took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which is shed for you and for many, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Glory to you forever and ever. Gracious God, with this bread and wine, we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus, and we offer ourselves to you in him. Send your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts, that we may know the presence of Jesus in the breaking of bread and share in the life of the family of your children. Glory to you forever and ever. Father, you call us to be your servants. Fill us with the courage and love of Jesus that all the world may gather in joy at the table of your kingdom. We sing your praise, Almighty Father, through Jesus our Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Glory to you forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We, being many, are one body, for we all share in the one bread. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At St. Paul's, we have the opportunity to partake of communion physically as well as spiritually today. Uh, consecrated wafers, each infused with drops of wine, can be picked up on Saturdays between 2 and 2.45, or by uh, appointment from a table just inside the main entrance. They're in individual paper cups and covered with a sealed baggie to make them safe for everyone. Uh, we recommend that you hold on to the wafer and partake physically during communion uh, at this very moment of the service. The body of Christ, given for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Let's partake together.
And all of us, whether or not we're partaking physically of the bread and wine today, have the opportunity to feed on our Lord in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And so I invite us all to say the prayer for communion on our screens together. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Now we say together the prayer after communion. Holy and blessed God, as you give us the body and blood of your Son, guide us with your Holy Spirit, that we may honor you not only with our lips, but also in our lives. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. That the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. We have uh, now part one of an interview I uh, had with Betty to help us to get to know Betty a little bit better. We'll watch part two next week, but uh, here we go now with part number one of this interview. Well, it's, it's great to be able to, uh, uh, for the next couple of minutes, uh, uh, chat with, with Betty. Uh, Betty, as I mentioned last week, uh, the, the, those who, who didn't uh, get a chance to see that, uh, is going to be ordained uh, deacon on the 29th and then uh, will be serving uh, as deacon at St. Paul's. And of course, we're, we're thrilled and delighted, uh, Betty, about that. So, welcome to, to our, our parish. And uh, so, this next few minutes, I'm just going to ask Betty uh, a few questions, uh, just so we can uh, get to uh, to know Betty a little bit better, and uh, um, just uh, kind of uh, this shared journey, we can kind of uh, begin that uh, that that process uh, of uh, of fellowship. So, the first thing I, I was going to ask Betty is if you could please tell us. Uh, a little bit about yourself, uh, like things like you know where you were born, where you grew up, uh, when you came to Calgary, uh, uh, family, uh, things like that. Okay, thank you, Fergus. Um, I was born in a little village called Bentley, just west of Lacombe. I grew up on a farm with my mom and dad, two brothers and two sisters, being the second youngest. I moved to Calgary 52 years ago with my husband, who I lost uh, five years ago. Um, and it has actually been the longest time I have ever lived anywhere it is in Calgary. That's about, uh, I don't know whether there's anything else you want me to say. Uh, I think we do have some, some uh, children. Well. Oh, uh, that is true. I do have 
I have three children. I'm my oldest son, who is married and lives in Dallas, Texas, and has lived there for over 30 years, and has one son who is becoming a lawyer. I have a daughter who lives now in Bakersfield, California, but also has been all over the world as an expat. Her husband is a geologist, and they have two children. I have uh, one daughter uh, who is married and living in Vancouver, and one son who is also married and living in Vancouver. And my youngest son lives here in Calgary, and um, he's married, and he uh, works as a coach, uh, tra uh, tra driver or um, bus driver with Southland Transport right now as he got laid off with the pandemic from Calgary Transit. And he has one son and uh, his son now uh, has uh, uh, severe Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, so he needs lots of care. Thanks, so now, and now um, you, uh, so you mentioned that there are a couple of grandchildren who are still married. Uh, do you have any great grandchildren? Uh, or... No, I don't have uh, any grandchildren. I have no great grandchildren, and uh, probably uh, it may be a long time before I do because my um, granddaughter um, is um, very ill with. Uh, um, fourth stage metastasized breast cancer and is taking treatments. But um, her uh, brother, my grandson, just got married last September. So there are no great grandchildren at this point. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm so sorry for the, uh, that uh, health challenges she's facing right now. And we'll certainly be keeping her in our prayers and, and, and also uh, uh, the child. Um, who has a muscular dystrophy too, of course. Uh, um, now, uh, let's go to the next question, which is, I uh, wonder if you could share some significant markers in your uh, spiritual journey. Well, when you ask me to share some significant, now I've got them down as memories, maybe markers in my spiritual journey. I think my grandmother was one of the most important part of my spiritual journey. She um, was a, a very uh, devout Christian and uh, certainly had a lot to do with my part of my spiritual journey. I've also had many other people who have helped me along, including Archdeacon Crowder, if some of you may remember him, um, Bishop Gary Wolsey, and the Reverend Helen Belcher. Yeah, uh, I, I was speaking as a clergy person, putting my clergy hat on, and that's, that's wonderful to hear when, when the clergy are able to, to, to kind of have a enough of a, an impact that we would be kind of a marker or one of the uh, uh, memories uh, with, uh, for your spiritual journey. I, I know my, myself, uh, as I look back, um, the two of the ones who were most influential for me were both clergy. Um, the first one was from Lethbridge, and uh, uh, I've often said to folks that outside of my dad, who was the, the, the man, at least the one who's a uh, a, a man and, and not uh, Jesus God, the God man, uh, but uh, he is the one who's had the most impact on my life. Uh, and then the other was, was in um, uh, Toronto, and uh, honestly, when I saw him, he was exactly what I felt he should be as, as a priest, you know. Like, uh, so the impact uh, of, uh, of my life, and I, actually, I'm now getting almost to the age that he was when I was there. Uh, and so, uh, it's funny because he seems so wise and stuff when I look and I compare with myself, I'm like, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I yeah, probably in all the same way, I'm sure, but you know, that's just the way it is. But, so, oh, that's great. And, and uh, um, now, um, I know you've had lots of uh, involvement uh, in, the, in the diocese with different things, or, uh, and so I was going to 
ask you to give us a plug for two of them. Uh, one of them is the Anglican Fellowship of Prayer. Uh, you could just tell us a little bit about your involvement with that and then what, what, what it is uh, and some of the perhaps resources that people may not be aware of, even though Dinah uh, in, uh, in our parish uh, works very hard to try to communicate that with people. But this is a, a chance for that, some extra, it's an extra press for, for AFP. Well, I've been involved with the Anglican Fellowship of Prayer for a long time. I really can't tell you when I first joined them, but it's been a very long time. Um, and uh, now I am their resource person. I took over this position when Diana, Diana, I'm sorry, Diana Brew resigned from the committee. Um, there are uh, so many good resources available through uh, the Anglican Fellowship of Prayer, and now all our resources are free to anyone who wishes them. Um, there is also, with along with our resources, is um, Esther Jackson's uh, beautiful artwork that we sell as cards or posters also. Um, those are not free. And um, so uh, many of the resources have been introduced to this parish through Diana. So um, I think uh, as we go along between Diana and I, we can certainly introduce some more of our resources. You're on mute, Fergus. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wonder how many more times that will happen. Uh, but, uh, so, yeah, one of the things that uh, uh, we have done uh, sometimes uh, is uh, we've had uh, on a table, you know, like some of the little brochures and stuff, and, and we've actually got uh, a spot kind of designated in, in the, uh, the hall for AFP material. Um, and we will certainly, you know, once we are able to gather in person again, we'll make sure that we draw people's attention to that again, because there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, and uh, it's, you know, like how do you pray as, you know, as a family, you know, uh, what kind of things could you, you know, and this kind of stuff. Uh, so that's great. I'm glad, so glad that you were able to uh, help Diana with So, uh, with apologies for my ramblings, um, it was lovely to have a, a few minutes of getting to and to know Betty a little bit, and we'll get to know her a little bit better uh, as we look at part two uh, coming up uh, next week. And the last part of our service today is the blessing of uh, graduates, our grad celebration. And uh, today we have the wonderful uh, joyous privilege of being able to honor uh, six grads, uh, all of whom, uh, as I said at the start of the service, we've had uh, the wonderful privilege of seeing grow from the small beginnings uh, of childhood to these milestone markers of adulthood. And so and this is just uh, uh, alphabetical, uh, and it's got, uh, uh, we'll start with those who are graduating from high school, and then we move al once again alphabetically to those graduating from post-secondary. So we start uh, with Baraka, and uh, Baraka is graduating from uh, Joanne Cardinal Schubert High School. Then we have uh, Declan, and uh, both uh, Baraka and, and Declan, uh, those were the, the two kid, children in the Little by Little uh, song. So Declan uh, is graduating from All Saints High School. Then we have Freddie graduating from Henry Wisewood High School. We have Rianne graduating from, again, Joanne Cardinal Schubert High School. And now when we go to the uh, post-secondary grads, we have Marina graduating from the uh, UFC with a Bachelor's of Science majoring in kinesiology. And uh, last but certainly uh, not least, uh, we have uh, Zachary or Zach,
graduating from SAIT with a diploma in Information Technology Software Development. So we congratulate all of our grads. If we were um, able to be here physically in person, we would be uh, applauding at this point. So I'm going to, to applaud, and uh, wherever we are, let's do that together. And you can actually, if you want to, I, I see last week people were commenting on Facebook and doing a little clap uh, uh, emojis in the comments. So that's uh, one thing you could do on Facebook if you'd like. And let's uh, share together now a blessing of the graduates. Before you were even formed, God knew you. While in your mother's womb, God named you. At your birth, God's breath filled you with life. Today we celebrate what you have become at this moment in time. And so we pray. God of our beginnings, we thank you for the gifts of these graduates, their excitement, their awesome wonder and curiosity, their open speech and encouraging words, their contributions, have blessed and challenged us, and we have become a richer and more diverse community because of them. As they step forward into the world that awaits, comfort their fears with the full knowledge of your divine presence. Strengthen their resolve to walk in the footsteps of Jesus as modern-day disciples in a world that needs their spirit. Guide their feet as they move through life, protecting them from the pitfalls of darkness, while they help to lead future generations into the warmth and promise of your light. We ask this blessing upon each of them, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And there's no better way, I think, that we could close than by singing our the adoration of God and God's faithfulness to us. Great is thy faithfulness. The words are on our screen.
Everybody is invited to join our uh, post-service virtual coffee time via Zoom at 11.30 this morning. And the slide on our, our screens shows uh, what you need to do uh, to get the link uh, for that. And it would be wonderful to share this time of fellowship together with you. Now, let's go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.